Uh, good morning. I know it's, it's early for you guys. It's been a long week, so I'm a little tired. Bear with me. But I'm really excited to be talking about this framework that has been going around Rust for many years. Um, and I've been, I've been playing with it many years. So overview, what I want to talk about is kind of the, the highs and lows, the good and the bad of MoveIt. And also um, kind of some pro tips that I've gained over the years of working with this over and over again that I want to share with you to help you if you're interested in controlling robot arms yourself. And so that's my timeline there. And so I'm Dave Coleman. And why am I talking to you about this? I uh, am a PhD student with Nicholas Carell at University of Colorado Boulder. And I started working on MoveIt um, with Eagle Jones and, and Yon Sukin at Willow Garage when it first was being written, so before it was released. And I made the setup assistant, uh, along with many other pieces of it I've worked on. Um, so I've been a longtime maintainer of it, as well as many other ROS packages, and I've contributed to OMPL and so forth as well. Um, so a, a background of what MoveIt is. So a raise a hand. How many people here know more than a sentence about what MoveIt is? Like you've used it, or you've struggled with it, or <laughs> you've benefited. Awesome. OK, just getting to know the audience. Um, so it's a, a framework for motion planning, which means it's doing path planning, it's doing collision checking, um, manipulation. It's having to do with perception input and the kinematics control. There. So you see this video here showing an, an old demo of MoveIt um, when it was first being released of its capabilities. It could do a lot more than this, but it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, so the credit, to, to give credit, um, Yoan Sukin and Sachin Chita led this project up uh, at Willow Garage and, and wrote it, along with many others. It's been a big collaboration with a lot of universities and companies. So that's been really cool to see these different libraries um, of robotics research being brought together in this one framework. Um, before this, there was ARM navigation, and so this was kind of a, a rewrite um, of that initial raw stack um, that came out in March 2010. Um, and so I looked up in GitHub, there's been 31 contributors to MoveIt core alone, but uh, as I'll talk about later, uh, MoveIt consists of many different repos, so there's been many, many contributors across the, the, all the repos. Um, it, it's currently in C++ and Python, you could expand it, there's been you know, MATLAB bindings and such, but primarily C++, and it's all under this group, ROS Planning. Uh, so uh, one exciting development was last month, we had our first MoveIt community meeting, and the results were astounding. Uh, Sasha and Chia did a great job of leading that up. We had over 240 people registered, and 150 who actually attended, and then many more who've watched it on YouTube since. And so I think that's just really amazing to talk to the popularity of this, this software, is that we could have an online meeting that, that big. Um, so we had a bunch of speakers at that event. Um, overall, uh, according to, uh, I think, last year's Ross survey, it was number three package in terms of popularity. Um, 700 members on our, uh, our, our Google mailing list right now. Um, 10,000 installs this year, 11 papers in ICRA, five papers in IROS this year, and the, yeah, the common statistic is like over 65 robot types worldwide, and so many of those robots each. So it's being used everywhere. So this is something that you should pay attention to, and like, um, if you're interested in manipulation, this is a, a good option for you. Uh, a few metrics I've put together on the community, um, there's been a continuous increase in the mailing list membership, uh, code contributions. Particularly this bottom right, you can see uh, contributions to OMPL and OpenRave, and then move it just kind of starting late, but skyrocketing. So it's done a real good job of getting general acceptance across the robotics community of people who are doing motion planning and the different pieces that, that involved in that. Um, and at the very top, you see some stats on the types of people using it. Um, so 44% graduate students would be the biggest portion, but you can see more there. Um, so recent news is that uh, just, you know, things are still happening. Uh, benchmarking is getting rewritten, which is terribly overdue, so I'm excited that uh, Mark Mull and the Kravacki Lab are working on that. Uh, Stomp's being revised, which is a motion planning method, and Descartes is a, is a new Cartesian-based planner that is going to offer some functionality that MoveIt isn't as strong in right now, although uh, integration isn't complete with MoveIt, but it's, it's a complementary piece of it. Um, and then uh, Fetch is working on making plugins for collision checking so we can try different uh, collision checkers. Uh, and yeah, Mike's taking over uh, maintenance of the releases, so that's great. So um, I've already talked about what it's done well, but I'm talking about more what it's done well. Um, the, the best part of MoveIt in terms of getting acceptance has been the setup assistant. Um, and, well, maybe that's too full of myself to say that because I was the, the, the writer of that. But um, if you get nothing out of this talk, 
if, except for this, if you want to use Move It, you can quickly get some basic functionality just by launching this, this wizard, essentially. Um, and it takes your URDF, you know, the center thing in ROS, and it'll allow you to define um, semantics and settings and configurations so you can quickly get uh, Move It running with a quick start demo. Um, and so th this has been a big reason why uh, it's, it's increased. You see it's a, a very popular feature in this survey we took. Um, and it, it has some, some cool features in there. Other things that have made it very um, accepted in the community is it's just it's GUI tools. So if you're, if you're new to motion planning and you want to get deeper into it, this is a quick way to uh, get basic start goal state planning. So we have these interactive markers in, Mar in Arviz, and you can you know, hit plan for different planners and see which ones, uh, how they result in terms of uh, how smooth their path is or how long it takes to plan. You can compare libraries. So really powerful functionality. And we achieved this using just uh, a simple plugin inside the Arviz interface. So if you're working on other packages in ROS, I encourage you to also make plugins similar to this. This whole bottom piece here is a Move It specific plugin. And we have different displays as well. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so at the core of Move It, it's a, a way to compare different academic libraries of research. Uh, and so we've had this, you know, this continuous problem of someone makes an algorithm and says, oh, mine's better than this one because I benchmarked it. But the problem is that the person implemented both versions. Well, here, we get different people implementing their own algorithms the best way they can, and then you can have a more fair comparison. I mean, there's still problems, but overall, you can compare OMPO versus SPPL versus CHOMP versus STOMP. They're all, they're all ways of doing motion planning from state A to state B. Um, but they have very different approaches, very different schools of thought, uh, as well as comparing collision checking libraries, uh, perception, and inverse kinematics. And there was a paper published about benchmarking the pieces and move it. So if you're working on research, this is a really good way to test your code against other people's and, and get some you know, tables and results in your papers. Um, and if you're working in industry, this is a good way to figure out which algorithms that exist are best for your application, because these all have different strengths and weaknesses. And because this is still you know, cutting edge robotics, there is no right one, per se. It, just, it all depends on somewhat how you tune it and somewhat what you're trying to do. Um, of course, it's robot agnostic. So like I said, it's worked on lots of different robots. Um, and then a few details is like some people complain it's complex. Um, but at the same time, that gives you so much flexibility. Um, so it can handle all sorts of kind of esoteric things, such as, uh, well, Groups of joints aren't esoteric. So you could say, I only want to plan with the arm, or I only want to plan with my, my leg, or I only want to plan with the, my, my torso and arm. So you could do things like that. But it also handle multivariable joints, would be, which could be um, a shoulder joint that has two degrees of freedom in one joint, or it could be uh, your, your pose. So if you have a, a six degree of freedom pose. But this allows you to do things like um, this top picture is actually a quadcopter that Someone's gotten to work and move it, which just blows my mind that people are using it for that kind of application, but go for it. There's a lot of good, good features that would help you there. And the bottom picture is underwater robots. I guess it's hard to see these pictures, but manipulation underwater with a floating robot and these other notions allow you to do that, mimic joints, um, and, and things like constraints. So orientation constraints would be you can tell move it to always keep your hand within visible of your, your, your sensors, so maybe for visual serving applications. Or uh, orientation constraints would be like, don't spill your, your cl uh, glass of water. So uh, typical use patterns. This is something that I, I just wanted to express to the community that Move It is, is more than just the Arvis plugin that I talked about recently. Um, a common problem I see is when you're first getting started, you use a setup assistant, and you get all these beautiful launch files created for you, and you launch it, and you have this interactive GUI, and like, yes, I can do motion planning. And then right afterwards, there's this like quick, cliff of like, now what do I do? Like no one, no one understands the next step. And so uh, I'm going to try to explain some of that. So like I mentioned, there's the Arvis motion planning plug uh, Here's a different robot, because it's you know, any robot you want. Um, but beyond that, there's, I'm going to go in order from the most high level to the most low level. So this is uh, a tool that is like a scripting interface. Uh, it's been done in lots of different environments. Um, I know things like PyRide or ROS, Python, you can kind of get similar functionality. But this is a move it specific one where you could say A equals current joint state, and then plan to random, and then move to B. And it's just a, a quick way to, to test if your robot's working. And I um, thought I'd mention it. Uh, and then going down the stack, there's a Python interface, which we have in this notion of a, a separate node in, in the ROS world that does the, the motion planning for move it. And then you can have your own node, uh, say a Python script file, 
where you can talk to it over the ROS messages and actions and services. And so this exposes it for Python. And so here's a simple demo of taking your left arm and setting a Cartesian goal for it. So I want to be at this uh, position in the world. And then the very end, just dot plan. And so there's, I, I left out some details, of course. But overall, you can get some pretty uh, powerful functionality with very few lines of code with these, these high-level abstractions. Um, but these high-level abstractions come at a cost, which I'm going to get to, uh, which is basically that if something's not working, which is, you know, it's open source, that can happen, or you want to add features to it, uh, it's, it gets harder to go through all the layers. And so, um, personally, I like to work a little bit lower. Um, this isn't lower. This is just a C++ version of what I just showed you. But same code in C++, pretty straightforward. Um, and then underneath those two, uh, they're called move group interfaces. There's uh, just a bunch of raw actions and services. And if you're going to use the services and actions, you probably could just use the, the move group interface. Um, but I mentioned that they're here. This is a, a diagram from the website that shows some of the available actions between um, this move group node that I just mentioned and whatever user interface is. So this could be your Arvis plug. It could be the commander. It could be your own high-level like um, executor who's deciding, okay, now I'm going to pick this up here and move it here and then deliver this to this bin. That's kind of the, the interface here. So um, pro tip, this is what I'm excited about sharing is I, I personally, as like someone who's been using Move for many years, I don't prefer to use all those layers. If you're new, go for it. I mean, I, I recommend it. But um, if you're, for example, in the bottom here, if you're a researcher and you want to test kind of a, a new way of doing motion planning, sometimes you need to be able to just really reach in there and like debug the whole stack. And so I just use the C++ directly. And so this is a mess of code, and I don't expect you to like digest it. But uh, overall, I'm just trying to demonstrate um, that you can load your URDF manually using these quick classes and then create your planning scene. And I'll explain what these means later. Um, and then a planning scene monitor and then your planning pipeline. At the very bottom, there's this tertiary execution manager. So you can do your entire planning pipeline, your whole stack, all in one main. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say here is that you can use Move It without having tons of extracted services and actions. Um, and so there's pros and cons to this. Uh, this way of developing. Um, but particularly, like, if you're using GDB, you can quickly see your backtrace if there's like a seg fault and see exactly where it's come throughout the stack, as opposed to jumping between all these different nodes. Um, it's kind of an ideology of ROS. One thing I'm excited about is in ROS2, we're going to have these, these uh, nodes that you can extract and connect again. We, talked, we heard about this yesterday, where you can have a distributed system, but maybe when you're actually deploying, you want to have them all typically coupled with the shared memory or the, the different inner process communication. I, I might be saying that stuff wrong, but um, so just uh, overall, like you, this is I recommend if you're trying to figure out what's next after the high-level GUI demos. Um, so uh, I, I referenced this earlier, but move it can be very complex and it can be very intimidating for beginners. Uh, and also, if you're just not familiar to move it, I, I just wanted to give you an idea of what's inside this black box called move it. Um, and so at a high level, these are all the components. Um, move it doesn't do task planning, not yet at least. Um, so if you're, if you're into task planning, that's going to be this, uh, your own separate thing, or this could be your GUI, or could this be a, a human loop teleop? So in DARPA Grand Challenge, they, they had partially human loop teleoperation, so they'd do some things, but it'd help with other pieces of it. Um, so whatever level of automation you need, it, it can kind of adapt to that. But move it's more focused on the motion planning itself between two states or, or two constraints and goals. Um, so there's interfaces. And then on the, the side over here, we have benchmarking tools, which have been kind of rough in the past. But um, right now, there's pull requests that I'm really excited about. They're going to kind of overhaul that from work at the Carvaki lab. Um, lots of configuration settings. And we use, you know, extensively we use ROS params and YAML files. Um, I'm excited about ROS2 to have a slightly better way of, of taking ROS parameters and combining that with dynamic reconfigure. And those tools are, are very much needed. I've been wanting to develop that myself for years, and, and I have a little bit. But um, at the bottom, we have execution. So we have your controllers, which could be like a ROS control or Oracos, whatever you want. Um, but we have interfaces for those, basically. We have the planning algorithms, which is kind of the meat, the main idea behind Move It is exposing the planning algorithms. Um, one could say that Move It was developed to take OMPL, the planning library, and connect it to robots, like in ROS. 
Um, that could be one of the original purposes of it. But of course, it's used for other things besides just OMPL, SBPL, CHOMP, and, and whatever else you can dream up of. Um, but part of planning is that you need to do inverse kinematics and forward kinematics. Forward kinematics is just built in because it's pretty simple. But inverse kinematics, you need, it's a plug-in you need to choose. Uh, there's different pros and cons to how you use it, iterative or numerical. Um, and then collision checking. And then the planning scene is this other functionality that's basically like maintaining a video game world of your environment. So you're saying there's a table here, there's a floor there, there's the cup over there that I want, and it's keeping track of the robot state, of the state of things in the world, and it's kind of sucking in all your data and having one central place. Um, there's this, there's this, this idea of a world that it's maintaining and it's having your meshes. It can also include the Octomap, if that's how you want to represent your perception data. So it's sucking in joint states and TF and your Octomap updates, so your, your point clouds, all that and kind of combining it in a way that your planning algorithms can then play on top of. Um, so a little deeper, uh, at its core, Moveit is a plug-in architecture. Um, I think it's safe to say that in ARM navigation, the original package uh, in Willow Garage's early days, it was very built on the idea of we're going to have all these different nodes and they're going to accumulate through services and, and, and actions and, and topics. And in the rewrite of Moveit, it became instead a plugin architecture so that we had more power. You can quickly transfer things faster. And uh, like I mentioned a minute ago, maybe in move, ROS2 we can move back away from that. But for now, um, think of this as if you're an expert in one particular piece of this, you can contribute back your work or test your work. So if, if you're working on this new IK solver that does whole body kinematics and can take in all these null spaces, please like turn that into a plugin for our IK solvers and like even contribute it back. That'd be that'd be great. Um, uh, controller managers. So there's there's all sorts of different plugins and the perception's pretty biased to Octomaps right now, but it, it could be anything as long as you can segment and whatever idealization. There's certain things in here that are, are assumed based on, at the time, what we were needing, um, or at least the other developers were needing, but uh, this could be adapted even to make it even more general as use cases arise. Um, I already talked about planning scene monitor, so I think I covered that. Um, planners, currently, uh, these are the, the main ones. Um, realistically, OMPL is the, the only one that's like well-maintained. Um, but the other two have had revived support recently. Uh, in particular, uh, Mike Ferguson has been working on SBPL, which is a search-based planning library for, coming from Mac Likachev's lab, and Chomp and Stop optimization-based libraries coming from uh, Kyle Kirshnan et al. I just butchered that name. I apologize. Um, and the Ross Industrial Group has been reviving that. But uh, OMPL is a really great, the open motion planning library, is a really great approach to motion planning because it can plan in very cluttered scenes. And so it can plan between obstacles and avoid local minimum. Um, it's a randomized sampling-based motion planner. And it's coming from the Kravaki lab. And so if out of the box, when you use a setup assistant, it's going to automatically configure some default settings and it can um, figure out its own, it'll automatically tune itself for your robot in some pretty clever ways um, to get functionality, where the other two take a little more grease and, and, and elbow grease to, to get working. Um, and I have to mention out there, some of my like, PhD research has been putting experience planners into OMPL and into Moveit. And so it's required me, which is one reason why I work in the C++ level, to really dig deep into some of the assumptions and tweak things, and I've been slowly putting pull requests back in. But an experience-based planning is essentially, instead of researching the environment over and over again from scratch, uh, we can take our previous experiences, our previous motion plans, and kind of collect them over time. And the idea is that if you're doing the same motion over and over again, particularly some like walking over here and then walking over there, it should get really good at doing that task. If you ask me to suddenly reach behind my back and I've never done that before, it's OK if it takes longer to solve that. So that's been some of my personal work. I just throw that in there. Um, plan request adapters, for those who uh, have always wondered what these are, um, they're what takes the academic, theoretical, I'm in simulation, everything works, and it converts it into the real world of like, we have noise, we have en encoders that aren't exactly right, or we have you know, sensor values. So there's a series of plugins, and, and you can actually add more, I guess they're called adapters in this case, that um, say, you know, the world is an ideal, and we're going to kind of twiddle it. So for example, uh, well, time parameterization is a little different from what I just said. It, it takes your, your kinematic plan, so you plan in position space. So all you know is like where I'm going to be at this time. Um, and it adds velocity and acceleration constraints to it. Um, so I'm going to back up for a second and say that currently, at least with OMPL, to make it computational, computationally tractable, 
Um, the algorithms all plan in just geometric kinematic space, so they don't have a notion of, of, of velocity acceleration because that would be very slow to compute. Um, but when you, add, when you add that adapter to it, it then takes the max velocity accelerations and, and parameterizes the trajectory over time. The other adapters here, though, what I was talking about before, is it checks, so let's say your joint is like right beyond the limit because you happen to push it too far when you were recalibrating. Um, normally, move it or similar software would be like, it's out of limit, there's an error, you have to manually correct it. But in this case, it can detect that it's just slightly out of the joint limit, and it can kind of randomize, like fix the joint just back a little bit within the threshold, and then continue planning. And then after it's done planning, it comes back, and it adds that state to the very beginning, and it can actually fix itself out of there. Similarly, if it's in collision, so let's say your hand's on the table. Um, I'm not in collision with the table per se, but your algorithm might think you are because you're so close to that geometry, to that mesh, or whatever representation you have. And so it's important to be able to, we kind of like shake the arm until it's above the table, and it thinks it's not in collision. We plan, and then we add that actual state back. And so just little tricks like that that are very necessary to make this work in real life. Um, Another component is the IK solvers. Um, KDL is a pretty fantastic library um, coming from the uh, Levin group in, in Belgium, I believe. Um, Kinemax library is part of the Oracle's project, and it just works out of the box. Pretty much no matter what your, your kinematic chain is. It only works for kinematic chains, which means you have a series of joints. You can't have a closed loop. But uh, it's been really successful for us because we can see you through the setup assistant, and then and you're off. Um, however, it's it's numerical, so it's, it's the order of magnitude is slower than an analytical solution if you can get one. So for some robots, for some geometries, uh, maybe for all robots, depending on your uh, algebraic skill, you can come up with numerical, so, uh, sorry, analytical solutions. Um, the best one we know of is IKFAST. It's coming from the OpenRAVE project, and you can run your URDF, which you have to convert to Collada, through their, um, their algorithm, and they, they spit out a, a C++ header file that can generate IK solutions way faster. And then, of course, things like PR2 have their own specific ones that have been hand-tuned. So if you're an expert on that, you can do that. So now I want to talk about um, the Amazon Picking Challenge. Uh, this is a, an event that happened recently. Let me just play this video. That I participated in, and I think it's very relevant to the Move It committee, uh, community and to the Ross community. Um, and so it's going to be my segue into the second half of, of problems I see with Move It. <laughs> um, so it's a similar vein to our, our presentation yesterday on the Draw Program Challenge where they use Move It and they had problems. Um, I used Move It for the Amazon Challenge and I had problems. Uh, so here's an initial video I came up with back like, very early in the competition of using Baxter and it seemed like I had pretty good success. Like, that was, a, I think, a pretty impressive video. Um, let me back up, though, and say that the Amazon Challenge, in case you don't know, it was a competition put together by Amazon to do picking from shelves. And so we had this bin, which you see on the left here, full of small products that were within the payload of robots like Baxter. And there ended up being 30 teams from around the world that came together in Seattle last year, or this year at, at ICRA, and competed. And it was really exciting. I, I, I love the experience. I, I learned so much. Um, and I think that's the most of the rules. They give you a USB stick with like which, which things to pick that they give the very last minute, and so you had to like upload it to your computer and say, okay, fully autonomous. There is no human in the loop. You just step away and you let it do its thing. So uh, initially, I was using Baxter, like you saw in that last video, but uh, I, I used Move It in some custom code to do some workspace analysis, and I found with Baxter stationary, the coverage of its arm over the shelf. Mm, it's hard to see this, but. We didn't have full coverage. There were some blind spots at the top of the shelf in the middle and the bottom of the shelf in the middle where its two arms couldn't reach. And on top of that, it couldn't get very much depth. So if there was a product in the back of the bin, uh, Baxter might have a harder time reaching back there because it's a thicker arm. Um, another problem was that down here you see this parallel electric end effector. Its stroke is pretty small, so we didn't have much range between products we could do. In fact, we couldn't pick up all the products with this end effector. So we were forced to look at other end effectors, so we started looking at some of the Yale open hands, which are, are, are great hands, by the way. They're under-actuated, uh, open source, open hardware projects. Um, and so with this end effector, we had even a smaller area because it's a very big hand, very bulky. And so when you have this constrained space, it's hard to reach things on the edge of the walls or, or further back. And so we looked at all these things and we decided that uh, the geometry and the kinematics of it didn't make sense. And we, so we went to a different robot. And so we switched to the, the, the new Jayco 2 that just came out in December. Our lab happened to have one of those. 
um, and it's you know a pretty good looking package. It's pretty thin, um, but be it's actually I think a little shorter than the Baxter's arm, and we only have one of them. Whereas Baxter we had two. So to reach the amount of uh, workspace and reachability that we needed, we added a one meter gantry. And it was just a off the shelf uh, gantry that we made some serial drivers for. We combined these two pieces of hardware um, into vir in one virtual robot. So in MoveIt, it just saw it as one complete system. There were two different ROS control nodes running to, to split the commands out, but MoveIt would automatically parse those trajectories into two separate controllers. Um, and we, we had a pretty good system running uh, just in the competition. Uh, there were some few bugs, you know, the, the demo, or not even demo, but like when it comes to actual competition time, particularly uh, calibration was our issue, and so we got about calibration. But um, I'm going to go over the, some of the system that we, we built, or, or that I built a lot of this. Um, it's pretty standard. Our, our team name was Picnic, by the way, so I put our little name up there. But uh, this is kind of just the standard sense, plan, act paradigm, which I'll talk about more later. But uh, let's start at the Asus XTM Pros, which are pretty standard. We had two mounted on gantry. They'd go up and down with the gantry, but they were not fixed to the arm. Um, a lot of people were like, well, then you have interference. And we did, but it still worked. The, the middle part, there's a little bit of like infrared overlay, but um, it, it worked. So our perception team um, at Colorado, it's a different lab. They use SDF Fusion to generate these meshes. And so in this picture at the top left, we have an Oreo box. And this is the kind of mesh they'd send over to us. Um, the, red, the red arrows indicate ROS messages. And so one thing you'll notice is that we use very few ROS messages. I guess I'm not picturing some of them. But overall, um, this whole bottom half was one giant move it based node of processing. And I just, again, I prefer that um, way of debugging and developing. But the, their, their CUDA-based perception pipeline would pass through a, a ROS message to what we call our picnic manager, which is you know, our picking and placing manager, um, this mesh. And from there, we generate a bounding box. So we did an assumption that all objects had bounding boxes, and that's what we thought of them. We didn't even deal with the mesh after that. So once we had a bounding box, we would add that to the planning scene, which is that tool that keeps a video game in representation of the world. And, and then we'd go down to this manipulation manager, which is basically a, a custom pipeline, but underneath it uses a bunch of, of move it uh, uh, classes and tools to do manipulation, all the collision checking, all the IK solving that I've been talking about. Um, and so we, we built out this crazy grasp generator. We called it move it grasp. grasp. Um, it's not really been released, but I'm happy to. Um, and so this picture here is a picture of a, a bounding box with just thousands of, of grass positions that we, we would uh, generate around it. And so from there, we'd filter those out based on a whole slew of, of filters, kinematics, collision. Uh, we, we would do some like rough ones that would save time. We'd, we'd filter them if there was like a pre-plan or a post-plan to get to them. Um, and then we'd score the ones that were remaining based on some heuristics of how straight is it, how off. Um, just things that we learned as we were testing. So we'd like score them all and then take the best scored ones and put them through our grass planner, which would say, start here, move straight in, up, and back, basically. And then we'd use a combination of Cartesian planning in the bottom and OMPL, uh, RRT planning, and then send it off to our trajectory server. And we use a velocity trajectory server over to the Jayco2 and, and Gantry. And I have a video of this, which is a little bit long, but... I'm going to speed it up. So this is a view from Arviz. Um, and a lot of these tools are, are pretty easily available through Arviz markers and through MoveIt. So um, I think this is one of my favorite parts, is just being able to visualize all these. And this is some of the power of the ROS tools available to us. So these colors indicate the start state and the goal state. And you see it did a, a free base plan, and then it did a Cartesian plan, it did a lift and a retract. And then it had to put the object that it picked into the red goal bin. And uh, I display the trajectory in green dots to show you where it goes. And so it's a lot to digest if you haven't looked at this before, but for someone who's been staring at this for months, there's like a lot of data. It's very rich in data for us to debug what's going on. And, and being able to see inside your system, in my opinion, is such an important aspect of developing these complex robot systems. Uh, one fault, I might say, of MoveIt is that sometimes it's really hard to introspect to see what it's thinking. Why did it fail at this IK solution? Why couldn't it plan to here? And my advice to you is to use Arviz markers. Um, I made a package called Arviz Visual Tools and Move it Visual Tools that wrap Arviz markers into a lot of really handy shortcuts. And that has been indispensable. And 
I'm confident in recommending it because my, my teammates, my lab members who've, who've used it have really taken to it and contributed their own shortcuts because uh, it's, it's just really helpful to understand what's going on inside, under the hood. Um, so, takeaways from the challenge. Uh, the, the top half is kind of standard teamwork, uh, but in particular, uh, Grasping. We went for three-finger, like, standard grasping, and that was just a terrible idea. Um, everyone did suction who won. Um, suction was the way to go. Uh, objects were lightweight enough that you could just almost always get a high-volume vo suction system. Um, there was one object that was mesh that you couldn't suck, I don't think, so we thought, oh, we need the fingers for that. Um, our, our grouper could, in theory, pick up everything, but because of calibration and maybe some perception issues and, and so forth, uh, we, we didn't. Um, another takeaway is that low-cost hardware. I'm excited about low-cost hardware. Um, Baxter, you know, it's a whole new paradigm, or Jayco. These, these aren't industrial arms. They don't have the precision and the accuracy we're used to in robotics, but at the same time, it's what we need to, to move to the next thing. And I do have plenty of gripes with Baxter, by the way, but I'm really happy with Jayco. And <laughs> um, overall, with low-cost hardware, you need to do more reactive control. Um, so, like, visual servoing, particularly, which means that you can free space plan around your environment like this without, without having to use any visual servoing. But when you get to this last step of, like, there's my bottle, I'm going to pick it up, um, you need to have some, like, real-time loop that's moving back and forth to get it just right, especially if you have a, a slightly imprecise end effector. Um, a lot of teams actually had that in their feedback because they'd wish they'd use more visual serving. Um, calibration, I didn't really focus on this because I'm a motion planning guy, but it's, a, it's an important aspect um, that we should have focused on or, like I said here, reduce the needs. Um, the, the, first and, mm, the first and third place robots use mobile bases, and the benefit there is you have a much larger workspace. So when you're fixed, it's, you, you don't have as many places you can reach. Um, and we had a gantry, which helped a lot, but that was interesting. That I, I didn't think mobile bases would be a thing at, at the Amazon Picking Challenge. Um, slim arms, good visualizations. Um, of course, working together. So manipulation and perception historically always has this rift where they're working isolated and they occasionally will sync up, and uh, it's just not a way, good way to do it. In fact, likely in the future, what we need to do is it has perception not even working together as a team, but like in the code, much tighter integration, which I'll talk to a little more soon. Um, you can't just pass over a mesh across a ROS message and hope it works, in my opinion. Um, so, at least 10 teams used uh, MoveIt for their competition uh, to varying degrees. Uh, at least one used it just for collision checking, but I believe the rest, like, you'd full MoveIt stacks. Um, out of, I think, 30 so teams that competed, and none of the winning teams used MoveIt. And so this is a problem, because I want to see MoveIt being the winning teams, right? Um, so I, I, I love MoveIt, and now I'm going to kind of turn to the, like, what we need to fix about MoveIt. Um, the first team, Team RBO uh, and UT Berlin, wow, amazing. They had the oldest hardware, like this Nomadic XR4000 is like, the mobile base is so old, and of course the standard WAM arm isn't, you know, so glamorous anymore, but it did the job, and they had this just vacuum attachment. I'm sure you guys have, like, kept up with this news, so this is probably old hat to most of you guys, but the important part I want to mention here is that, uh, according to them, they did not rely on motion planning. Um, they, they have this system they've been developing for many years. They call it a hybrid automaton composed of sequences of controllers with sensor-based transitions. Uh, I think it's a quote. Um, and it's a different paradigm, and I think MoveIt could use a little bit of this. I'm not saying we move it's trash at all. MoveIt has really powerful and really great things, but um, particularly the ability to switch controllers at a low level. Um, Position-based control isn't everything. And, and so sometimes you want to do some impedance control or have a controller that's taking into account tactile feedback or visual serving. These are all obvious things to, to academics who've been working on manipulation, but doing it all together in a real software framework that's agnostic for robots is really hard. And so we're looking at a, a hard problem to solve. Um, similarly, to M MIT did the whole industrial approach, uh, and they used Drake, which is a competitor to move it essentially from MIT, and they use motion primitives like grasping, sucking, scooping, toppling, push, rotate, etc. Um, Got to go a little faster. I apologize. Uh, and then lastly, Team Grizzly. Um, you'll notice the points here are way different. In Team RBO, it's 148 points, 88 points, and then 35 points. So there's a huge gamut of range, and the rest of the teams were under 35 points. Um, and they didn't use MoveIt, they used a Cartesian motion planning algorithm. So, where MoveIt needs improvement? Um, reliability, right? So if you've used MoveIt before, you know that it's got serious reliability problems. 
Um, and so we need to have it so that when it fails, it tells you why better. We need to have it so that it, uh, it can t more, join in more optimal paths. Um, and so some solutions to this is to, to hybridize paths together, um, use cost-based planners, um, similar time on smoothing, and small tweaks to it. Uh, got a little faster here. Uh, I love this animation. <laughs> um, a, a big thing we need to move it is obstacle clearance. So out of the box, there is no direct support for increasing the space from obstacles. So it'll be collision free, but it'll just like swipe by your tables and your, thing, and your, and your things. And so if you have a, a low, pre low precision arm, it's likely going to hit something. And so there's different ways of doing this, using cost-based sampling-based motion planning, or using optimization algorithms like Stomp and Chomp. Um, Graspit support is really important. Um, Moveit was named after Graspit, essentially, which is this grasping library uh, that Matei and others developed a long time ago. It's kind of old software now, and it doesn't really work with URDFs or SRDFs. It's not Rossified. It's, it needs some work. And I propose that we just kind of start over, and we need a ROS package. It doesn't have to be Moveit related, but a ROS package that's tightly integrated with Moveit on during grasp. It could be geometric or physics-based grasp. Um, but it's a an, it's an thing that we're really needing right now. And finally, <laughs> things that we really need to fix is documentation. Uh, we have some really good tutorials to start off with, and then there's that cliff where you're just like, what do I do next? Um, and so to get more developers who, who understand Move It, who can contribute and keep it alive, um, we all need to work together, if you're working on Move It, I'm talking to you right now, to make more tutorials and, and make more uh, how-to articles on how to use Move It. So a future roadmap. This is what I'm really excited to share with you concerning um, things we can do better. Uh, in the future that we don't have yet. Officially, this is our list from our community meeting of things that we want to do by the end of the year. Um, but things I particularly want to talk about is the visual servoing again. So that's like right before you get to the end, I've already talked on this, is having uh, reactive control in the loop. And how that might look like is, let's say you have this very complex trajectory. Uh, this blue line up here, the first one on the far left, this is free space planning with OMPL, and pretty standard. But then before we get to the bottle, this yellow line, that's where you'd switch controllers. So in ROS control, you might, be, you might send a command, do switch. And at that point, you want to use impedance control because you want to have it more compliant to the, you don't want to put too much force in your object. And you want to use visual servoing to get the right thing. I've, I've been harping on that. Then there's the, the grass controller. You say, OK, now close gripper. And then we want to retreat and then do another free space planning. And then another uh, impedance based controller. And then this last red line, I think, is really interesting. It's something that moving isn't important necessarily, but uh, Descartes, the library that uh, Ross and Dush has been working on, it's really good at following semi-constrained trajectories. And I think moving needs to be able to support these different control modes. Um, and that involves adding metadata to our plans. So not only can we say this is the position, velocity, and acceleration we want, but we need to say this is the controller I want, and this is like how I want to do that controller. So if you're doing a visual, visual serving-based controller, you also need to say this is the object I'm looking for, this is where I expect it to be, and have integration with perception. So uh, in this sense plan act paradigm, uh, we're going from image to octomap to planning to time to trajectory in the ROS control, this, this loop. And in essence, what we need is to break out of this a little bit and have a real-time reactive control loop, where once we have this global plan that Move It generates, we take sensor data and more quickly run it through a real-time loop back to our controllers based on what application you're working on. And poking this hole through here sounds simple, but in the architecture, it's going to take some work. Other things that I want to see for controlling in Move It is we need an integration of ROS control with a setup assistant, um, rename some things that are a little bit ambiguous, um, and and the ability to have a controller in ROS control that's really tightly coupled with Movit. I think I might have said that. Um, from DARPA, we saw a lot of teams use affordance templates, which is a, a much fancier way of saying, this is where I want to grasp. So not only are you positioning the end effector, but you're saying, I have something like a drill from the DRC, and I want to move this piece over and then have the robot understand semantically what a drill is and how I grasp it. And there's been a lot of packages generated in ROS for this, but there isn't much support to move it into the mainstream. And I, I think that'd be a really good tool to have for people who are doing semi-autonomous motion planning. Um, calibration is out of the scope of move it, in my opinion, but we need better documentation and support for the calibration package that do exist. And so for those who are interested, uh, ROS Industrial, I've used their packages a lot, and they're um, pretty good about optimizing and, and figuring out where you're 
optimizing the parameters of your arm, as well as optimizing uh, your camera's location and the intrinsics and extrinsics. All those things, they get forgotten about in movement, but are very important. And additionally, Fetch Robotics has just come out with a, a similar robot calibration tool that uh, I recommend. So uh, MoveIt is developing much slower than it used to. So this is when Willow Garage closed, is when you see um, the code kind of slow down. And so I want to kind of as a, a farewell message say that I, I want to see um, move it more agile, more uh, accepting of changes and pull requests. And it's just kind of a struggle. So we want to support uh, industry partners and companies that are using move it. But we also want to allow academics and people who have new ideas and, and better ways of using move it to contribute back. So, and so there's this tension of how do we uh, balance this too, like breaking API versus not. Like, if, for example, Gazebo's done a good job of being very strict about not breaking API, except between major releases, but they do a lot of major releases. Um, so there's a lot of competitors like OpenRave, MIT Drake that I've mentioned, that have comparable functionality. And I, th I think if we don't keep MoveIt developing and, and accepting and changing and maybe breaking API, it's going to fall behind in, in the overall capabilities. Um, so currently we have 50 pull requests, and they've been around for many months, so I want to see those brought in more. Um, and we need things like continuous integration and more testing. Um, uh, one proposal that I'm, I'm out of time, but uh, as we, I think it would be really good to consolidate move it into one repo. There's always these errors where one Git repo of move it is out of sync with another, or we make these pull requests and it says, don't, don't merge this one, we merge that one, we merge that one, because we're distributed. And I look at projects, so we have a ton of different repos right now for move it, and I think one or two Git repos would make this so much easier for developers to use and for us to move faster in our development. Um, I look at projects like OpenCV and PCL, and, and they have these one Git repos with many libraries and sub-modules, and I think move it needs to move in that way also. I, I like to look at move it kind of like PCL and OpenCV, but for motion planning. So overall, I love move it. Um, it's been successful because it's easier for beginners, um, it needs more features, and, and in my opinion, stagnation should be the focus, stability should be the focus, but instead adding these new things and to make it better and more powerful. Um, and yeah, please contribute. Thank you. So Dave, you said you want to make breaking API changes to continue development. Do you have an idea for how to support a stable version and maybe a developmental version? Um, yeah, it's it's a hard problem. We have the distribution, you know, Ross you know releases every every year now, and, and so that's the ideal way I'd I'd say is to the next version be your development branch, but in practice that's hard because we have all these limitations on 14 over 4 versus 12 over 4 versus LTS support, and so like in reality a lot of us are sticking to LTS, and yeah, as you know, that's a, a problem that we're facing, and, and so I guess we could look to other projects in MoveIt and outside open source projects and, and how they do that, um, but we've been on zero, our major version is still below zero, so Technically, we can change whatever, but we don't want to do that. Maybe we should start doing major releases so that we can make those changes or just start MoveIt 2 um, because, you know, ROS 2.0 coming up, there'll be a lot of changes that we can integrate at the same time. Maybe one, one last question. When you try to grasp an object, how can you uh, make? How can you find out which is the object and which are actual collisions? Because when you get close, out, what's to the, the question? Where the object is? Yeah, because when you when you want to grasp an object, and you're getting close to the object, like with a pneumatic gripper, you're more or less colliding with the object and the gripper. How do you know when to grasp the object, or how do you know that you're not colliding, that you want, actually want to grasp it? Um, well, so uh, maybe tactile sensors, or the, uh, if, if you have tactile feedback on your hands, and there's a lot of good companies now that are coming out with commercial products for this, um, there's some very basic rules. Um, the PR2 has some papers about this, and many other robots have too, where when you're moving into the very fine-tuned last, last piece of the, the, the pick motion, uh, if you sense a touch on one hand, one side of your fingers, you move to the other side, or if you sense a detect on the front of your fingers, you should retract and then like adjust a little bit, retune. Um, and, and so those fine-tuned motions can make a huge difference in the number of successful grasps you can make. Um, and, and then visual serving where you have a sensor up here and you're looking down your object and you're, you see the frame of your hand and the frame of the object and keeping those aligned 
and like a real time loop is another way of really closing the accuracy of, of grasping.